Good morning. Thank you guys for coming back after break. I have the privilege of introducing Dr. Tyrone Davis, who I've known for, I won't say how long, but several years. <laughs> Dr. Davis is a native of Alabama and uh, finished his undergraduate degree from Dillard University. From there, he attended what was the Ohio College of Podiatric Medicine, it's now Kent State <laughs> University College of Podiatric Medicine. Uh, throughout his residency, he did his residency training at the VA in Richmond. Um, this included all kinds of medical and surgical procedures involving the foot and ankle. He is board certified fellow of the American Board of Lower Extremity Surgery. Lower Extremity Surgery. He's been in practice for over 24 years and has. Uh, been a host of several things, including a New Orleans medical television show and a guest speaker at many public events and radio programs. He has served on several public service agencies as well as been appointed by the governor of Tennessee to be a board member of the Tennessee Board of Podiatric Medical Examiners. We are honored and privileged to have Dr. Davis here and without further ado. Thank you, Dr. Thomas. <clears throat> Thank you all for allowing me the, the privilege of speaking at the Mississippi Podiatric Medical Association. Uh, it's, it's an honor to be here. This is actually my first time uh, coming down to be in the company of you all and also speaking. Uh, we unfortunately weren't able to do that last year because of the pandemic, but uh, I wanted to make sure to, uh, to attend this year. Uh, what I want to talk to you about, um, it's basically the evolution of the diabetic patient in the podiatric uh, medical community. We see an ungodly amount of diabetic issues, and those issues aren't just treated with cookie cutter approaches. We have to have um, a large armamentarium of, of avenues in order to at least diagnose and begin the treatment of these patients. And so, Part of what I'm going to speak to you about today, it covers a large range. I'll just focus on a few parts. Um, some of the other previous speakers who uh, spoke yesterday and today touch base on some of the issues. These are very, uh, you know, very broad. And so uh, one of the key things is if we don't have adequate circulation, if the patient doesn't have a uh, sufficient amount of circulation, uh, and protective sensation, then we encounter a lot of the, uh, the diabetic issues that we commonly see in our practice every single day. And so I'm a big proponent of uh, garnering um, and just trying to ascertain how much circulation a patient has, what's going on, because if we don't have enough blood flow, the antibiotics that we give the patient can't get to the infected site to heal it, um, and it, re it really doesn't matter what else we do, uh, it's, it's not going to work out right. Next slide. <clears throat> so some of the common things that we typically do before the patient even realizes that we're examining them, we're going to be checking for these basic things. Pedal pulses, uh, you know, uh, venous filling time, you know, if we see something that's kind of questionable, uh, we look for the temperature, we feel for the temperature, distribution, hair distribution. Um, also, the use of some Doppler ultrasound uh, techniques in the office. Next. Next. Uh, just pedal pulses. Next. By the way, these slides are going to go real fast, um, so feel free to ask me any questions. Uh, raise your hand, please. Um, we're just kind of looking for hair distribution. Next. <clears throat> elevation dependency before the patient even knows that I'm even looking for any type of circulatory issues with them by the time they sit up, sit up in the uh, treatment chair take the shoes off raise their their legs up I'm checking to see how much blood flow that I see returning back to the toes if, it, if it's pink if they have any hair distribution next uh, checking the skin temperature, that's, that's key, but that could be also misleading because if your room is extremely cold, their feet might be cold. Um, you know, a lot of the diabetics um, who are on dialysis will tend to be kind of cold. So not only check the temperature of the feet, but go up the leg as well. Next. 
Again, hair, hair distribution next. Uh, check the capillary field time. Pinch the toes. See if, that, if the blood flow returns or if it stays blanched. Next. Next. O oh, Doppler. Doppler. Next. This is, this is key for us. ABI. We really want to make sure that, that we check for the ABIs in patients that are questionable. We want that number to be as close to one as possible. But the caveat about that is once we hit one of an ABI, that could be misleading because the patient could have calcified vessels, which might give us a bounding pulse. So um, they, you may think that they have a good pulse, but they actually may not. So <clears throat> that would lead you to other steps that I'll cover later on. Next. So, uh, and I apologize for the uh, distortion uh, with our media today, but some of this is not lined up. Uh, but basically what it's saying is that, uh, you know, you really want to check for the AB ABIs. If it's greater than one, that could, uh, you know, extend your thought process to the possibility that it could be uh, a calcified vessel, could be a bounding pulse. So, uh, but if you have something of a 0.6 or less, you're running into some severe problems, maybe uh, critical limb ischemia. Next. What happens with peripheral arterial disease? Basically, and in a nutshell, the vessels aren't able to carry the appropriate amount of blood flow that we need. Why is that? Could be from a number of things. Could be from uh, sludge <laughs> in the vessels, could be a thickening of the, uh, of the vessel itself. Either way, the blood flow is not being able to uh, be transported efficiently and effectively to the uh, areas that it needs to go to. Next. So what it looks like in the vessel, um, it, on the left, blood vessel, the yellow area, that's basically a plaque buildup. So now you have a, a narrowing of the blood flow. Next. So risk factors, everybody's kind of been co covering this since we've been here um, at this conference. So of course it has not changed. Diabetes, smoking, hypertension, obesity, being a black uh, individual, chronic kidney disease, dialysis, all of those things um, are risk factors for PAD. And unless we address this and use um, uh, uh, the, the type of approach that incorporates all practitioners, we can't effectively address this issue. Next. So this is a point of interest here. Someone loses a leg uh, because of diabetes every 30 seconds of every day. Next. The take home from, from this particular slide is the lifetime risk of a diabetic foot ulcer is basically 15 to 25%. So you can have diabetes, um, but the but the, the chance of you developing the foot ulcer is basically 15 to 25% over your lifetime. So that's, that's, a, that's almost a fourth of all diabetics. They have that possibility at some point in time. Next. Uh, <clears throat> so basically it's kind of saying the same thing here. Next. Uh, the life you know, expectancy with PAD of course, is on the rise. Basically, what, what, what this is pretty much saying here. Increased strokes, heart attacks, things like that. Next. So here's the question to ponder. Um, in the US, basically 160,000 amputations are done each year. And what's, what's important to note is <laughs> most of these amputations um, as our previous lecture has uh, alluded to, they're done without the appropriate vascular workup. So when you see a patient in your office and you see something that appears to be worthy of amputating, some doctors do. Some doctors don't uh, spend the time or take the time to get adequate vascular assessment, workup, follow-up. They don't want to take the time to do that for whatever the reasons are. And um, unfortunately, over 50% of the amputations result from not having adequate vascular workup. Next. 
So I'm going to show you a graph that will just kind of bring all of this to home here in, in a second. But <clears throat> the, um, you know, the, the issues, kidney disease, you know, you're going to check for dystrophic nails, which all of us see that every day in our practice, non-healing ulcers, weak, weak pulses, smoking, all of that in our history taking process kind of clues us in to the fact that this patient is either healthy, not healthy, or questionable. And so we should never lose sight on the, the fact that this patient might run into an issue if we don't address some of the, some of the problems. Next. So here's what I'm saying. When patients come to the office, they're usually gonna to come to us, unfortunately, because of a problem. They have pain, they have something going on that they need to be, it needs to be addressed. They want you to fix it. They're not paying attention to something that has been going on for years, it's the here and the now. Well, usually, if the patient sees something on their toes, much like <clears throat> critical limb ischemia, they may not have felt it coming on, they may not, may not have had any issues, but they started to see the tips of their toes turning dark. And so that visual made them say, okay, well, I need to find out what's going on, so let me go to the doctor. Or if they start walking to the mailbox, and before they can come back to the house, they're catching cramps. They're having some leg pain, but once they sit down, it's gone. Or certain activities that they do causes pain, they stop with the activity, they feel better. And, and, and it gets to be more and more progressive and they come in to see you. Those are the things that the patients see and or feel that allows them to come or require them to come in to see you. But the key about this graft is 50% of the patients with peripheral arterial disease that have these issues that can lead to amputations don't even know it. They have, they're completely asymptomatic. No pain, no, no visual stimuli, none of that. Next. So the other thing that we do in our, our, our office, the neurological exam, basic sharp to dull, uh, Sims Weinstein monofilament testing, vibratory sensation, muscle strength, all of those are done. The patient really doesn't even know that we're doing it. We just automatically have the patient sit down, boom, we just touch them, feel them, put the little uh, tuning fork or the monofilament wire on there. We're doing our thing before, before the patient even realizes that's, that it's going on. Next. Sharp dull, next. Monofilament, next. I put this slide in here because this is what happens, and I found pretty much all of these things in my patients, either foot or in their shoes. And I have a patient right now, I'm, I'm, if I have time later on, I'll, I'll tell you about him. Uh, this causes people to end up having amputations because these objects will get embedded in their foot. They have, uh, you know, neuropathy, so they don't feel this. The only thing that they can probably tell is that they see some drainage in their socks or their shoes. And so they end up having these objects stuck in there in their foot get infected turns into an ulcer one thing leads to another and you know we, we this is another thing that we have to deal with next 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 so you know we see patients who have feet that look like this some of this is due to uh, you know having neuropathy so neuropathic issues vascular issues can certainly affect the soft tissues the tendons nerves, you know, muscles, and so you'll have one foot that's, that's different than the other. Um, skin changes, these trophic changes, of course the, the fungal nails, next. So if you don't feel well, you don't know that you're getting the buckling of the toes, the hammer toes, now you have a, an ulcer that's developing. You might think it's the beginning of tinea pettis, but it could very well be the beginning of, of an ulcer just because you can't feel that. Next. So these, these ulcers are in areas that we most commonly see them. They're high pressure areas. It's under the, the metatarsal heads. When I was in residency, I thought I was gonna get an opportunity to see <clears throat> this particular day, some vascular surgeons, uh, it was on the schedule that they were going to 
um, do a uh, mid-head amputation because of a diabetic ulcer. So I was all excited to go and, and witness that. So just, I guess, to point out the difference back then, years and years ago, of how some other specialties perform surgery and how podiatrists perform surgeries as it relates to the feet, I think, and I'm certainly biased because I am a podiatrist, we take a little bit more care in how we address feet, how we treat feet, and how we follow up feet. Uh, when I walked by and saw the vascular surgeon getting ready to amputate uh, the metatarsal head just underneath these ulcers, I was expecting to see everything, you know, sort of look like the way we would do it. What I saw was the patient was already neuropathic. The doctor just took a pair of bone rongeurs, stuck it right in the hole, clipped the head off, pulled the, 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 the head of the metatarsal out, wrapped it up. That was it. It was less than five minutes. That procedure was done. That's not how we do it. Uh, I, I hope they don't do that now, but this was, I don't know, almost 30 years ago. Um, but I said all that to say the most, one of the most common areas that we see ulcers in our, in our practice is right, on, on, right underneath the metatarsal heads. Those are high pressure areas. So we have to address that. Various techniques, you know, be it debridement, appropriate antibiotics, vascular status has to be okay, offloading, total contact casting, you know, any number of those or a combination. Next. So signs and symptoms. Uh, this is kind of what a patient will come in and say, Doc, my foot's been red, or I'm not feeling something, or I'm, I'm swollen, it's cool, something looks in, inflamed. Those are kind of the things patients will say or things that we will kind of look for. Next. Uh, <clears throat> next. So what happens with our, our nerves? Why, why do patients feel or not feel appropriately? It's because the nerves are damaged. High, uncontrolled diabetes. Uh, actually, the, the, you know, the diabetes might not always be high. It could just be uncontrolled. It could be low, high, low, high. It's never on the continuum normal level. And so, you know, your myelinated and unmyelinated nerve fibers become damaged, so you don't get the adequate um, uh, stimulation uh, from the dendrites of the nerves and all of that, so you end up with the neuropathy. Next. Next. Intermittent claudication. So, yes, these are the, some of the things that you're going to see cramping. Patients will tell you that. Next. Next. So, here's the critical limb ischemia. Usually when the patients see this, they're going to come in. If we see this, then we know we have to do something right now. If we don't, that's going to lead to an amputation of either a digit or a TMA or a BK. Uh, that's, that's going to, to lead to that. Next. Common treatment options. This is, this is, this is key because <clears throat> We have to use a multidisciplinary approach to any of our patients. Number one, diabetic patients will typically be referred to, to us by their primary care physician. Hopefully the primary care physician is really taking um, their time with their annual assessment of the patients. What I mean by that is asking the patient to remove their socks and shoes so that they can at least take a look at their feet. In order to, uh, to treat someone with PAD, you know, they're going to need to be on you know, some of the, the lipid lowering or antiplatelet drugs. Uh, of course, supervised exercise possibly. Endovascular therapy, that is key, and, and I'll show you that in, in a minute. Uh, I utilize that quite a bit, and it has proven to be probably more effective than uh, you know, surgical bypass, and in some cases, amputations, because I really want to prevent the amputations. <clears throat> so again, at the, at the bottom here, it, it, it's reiterating that uh, over 50% uh, of the amputations are performed without angiography or ABI or some type of vascular exam 
which is not good. Next. Endovascular. I utilize my endovascular team quite often and I will use, and that's, I have not heard that uh, during this conference where interventional radiologists have been used for this, but I do utilize those uh, for my endovascular procedures. Uh, it, it's effective, it's, it's, I say non-invasive, meaning it's, it's basically, it's not an open procedure, and you, the patient will be able to, to walk home that same day, you know, usually a few hours, and it gives you a good view of what's going on with the vasculature. If anything's occluded, um, they tend to be able to go in and open that up right there while the patient's on the table. Uh, if there's plaque in the vessel, you know, they can either remove that, they can either do stenting, uh, which I'll show you in a moment. Next. So here's, here's basically how it works. It's under fluoroscopy. Patient lies down. I'm sure all of us uh, have, have witnessed this. The thing I like about this is if you link yourself up with, be it a <clears throat> cardiologist who does this type of endovascular work, uh, vascular surgeon or interventional uh, radiologist, it would be a good idea if you have the time to not only refer your patients to this particular individual, but if that specialist is comfortable with you going and watching them do some of these procedures, it, 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 it helps you to be able to understand what your patient needs, because all patients need a little something different, but it also helps you to understand what type of work ethic this particular practitioner has, what care they take. Uh, you know, not all of them are the same. You know, so uh, and some of them are not as delicate as others. Next. So part of that is, you know, you know, arteriogram. So we've all seen that. Next. So if there's plaque in the vessel, I mean, they can do an angioplasty, they can blow up the balloon, open up the blood vessel, starting from the left. If that's the uh, constrictor that we have here, put the balloon in, open it up, it opens the vessel on the right, now you have a better flow of blood. Next. Stenting, if, that, if that's required, that can be done. Uh, the image on the left, where the arrow is, shows where the uh, circulation has pretty much come to a halt. After the stenting, the, the image on the right shows that the uh, blood is allowed to return. Next. Atherectomy, this is just showing different types of atherectomy uh, procedures, whether it's directional, rotational, laser, all of them, the premise is the same, to open it up to get better blood flow. Why? If we don't have adequate blood flow, like I said in the beginning, we can't heal our wounds. Next. So here's just a, a case study, 80 year old male, uh, coronary artery disease, former smoker, breast pain, claudication, uh, ABI of 0.6, next. After the procedure, the, before the procedure, the image on the left, uh, and I wish I had my laser pointer, the image on the left uh, shows where <clears throat> circulation is pretty much coming to a halt over here. Once it's opened up, you can see a bigger blood vessel. The blood is allowed to flow. Third image shows uh, before the um, procedure was done where the vessel occluded. Uh, once you have occluded blood vessel, especially a, a main blood vessel, you're going, your body will inherently start to produce collateral circulation where it's trying to funnel blood flow, where it's trying to funnel blood flow and it cannot. Uh, excuse me one second. Perfect. Um, so you have an, <clears throat> this is where the occlusion is. If you have that, blood flow cannot flow that it, in, in the path that it needs to. So you're going to inherently get all this collateral circulation because your body is trying to give it blood flow that it doesn't have. But once you open that occlusion and you get more blood flow, the collateral circulation starts to kind of dwindle down. Next. So consequently, this was pre-endovascular procedure. Two months later, able to save the, the patient's foot. Next. Same thing, pre-treatment. Next. 
post-treatment. Next. To uh, <clears throat> complete total occlusion of the superficial femoral artery, right in here, is completely occluded. You have all this collateral circulation that's trying to get more blood flow distally, cannot. Once that problem is corrected, blood flow resumes, now you have a natural wide channel and you don't have all of the excess collateral circulation out there. Next. Some of the stuff that's taken out though from this, by the way, I'm not being paid by any, any of these uh, endovascular uh, companies. This is just what I like to, to, to use as part of my armamentarium for treating patients that I think have questionable blood flow. Uh, so if there's an occlusion here, some of the, the uh, material that's removed is put over here, this plaque. They just take this stuff out of here. So can it come back? Yes, it can. That's why we have to have a multidisciplinary approach where um, other specialties are on board trying to address why this developed in the first place. Next. Next. So what leads into ulcers? Again, poor circulation, um, you know, neurotrophic changes, loss of protective sensation, all of those things can lead into ulcers. We've learned this in school, the Wagner classification from grade zero to grade five. Uh, one key classification of this is grade three, where you have the abscess and osteomyelitis. <clears throat> Next. Underneath the metatarsal heads, common locations for that. Next. We always trim calluses right along the medial uh, hallux uh, grade zero, but depending on the, the other issues with the patient, that particular patient might be at risk of developing one of the other stages of an ulcer if left untreated. Next. Turn into a grade one superficial ulcer. Next. Well, this is basically saying you can have grade zero leading to a grade one. You can have a grade one leading to a grade two, three, four, et cetera. It just depends on how progressive their disease is, what the activity is. Next. So that's a, a grade one ulcer leading to a grade two. This is actually a grade one ulcer leading back to a grade zero, which it could actually get better. Next. Grade two, next. Is it tendon bone exposed? Next. So something as, so this is an ulcer between the toes. An interdigital maceration can lead to an ulcer in someone who has poor circulation, neuropathic foot, um, ulceration, but sometimes tinea pitis, interdigital tinea can look like this too. Next, you know, tracking down to the bone, trying to do a bone culture, next trying to see if you have osteomyelitis, trying to see what type of organisms are growing with the foot that's swollen. Grade three, that's the infectious part. It has started to erode down into the bone. You can see that moth-eaten sign into the shaft of the uh, proximal phalanx. Next. Grade three, is it infected? Next. So this person's already lost their, their, their hallux. They're about to develop some issues over here, probably around the head of the fourth metatarsal. Next. So yeah, if you see a person that, that has an ulcer, you wanna check for the appearance, see if there's any exodus. What is their general health? Playing radiographs, that is such an, uh, an important tool that we have pretty much in our office. Laboratory testing, that's gonna come as well. Next. First, we want to check the appearance. If we see this in our office, we know right away that we're probably hesitant to debris this because we know something is forming underneath there. It's, it's like a boil waiting to erupt. Next. Sure enough, you, you, you know, you brought that, now you have oozing. Um, so you need to really find out what's going on. I heard previously that <clears throat> Uh, with the different types of antibiotics that you want to use, there's a host of antibiotics that, that, that we can use, be it IV or PO. 
by far the overwhelming majority of, of microbials that are in a diabetic wound will be your staph. So whatever you use, you have to incorporate some form of antibiotic that's gonna address that. Um, next. Next. So don't rule out the simple things where if you see a patient in your office and their foot is red, swollen, you see some exudate, you go and put them on antibiotics, um, you wanna tell them to elevate their leg, wash it, clean it, all that, come back and see me in two weeks. Don't rule out the fact that there could be uh, something stuck in the foot. I've, I've removed so many pieces of glass, nailed like the other slide that I showed you. And so what was causing their problem couldn't be solved with just the antibiotics, couldn't be solved with washing and cleaning and anything like that. It, the foreign body, which is this pen, needed to be removed. And so if you don't do that and end up in the emergency room with, you know, becoming septic and the emergency room doctor, you know, takes the x-ray and sees this and the patient wasn't told that in your office, now you're on the hook for that because you didn't, you missed that. Next. Next. <clears throat> so the prevalence of ulcers. Um, so basically up to 25% of diabetics will experience some, some ulcers at some point. Next. Next. So this is what I was saying. We need to have a multidisciplinary approach to the treat, the diagnosis and treatment of any and all of our patients. And what's not included on this list, uh, which uh, I'm a big proponent of, are interventional radiologists. Next. So podiatry savings. Why, why, why do I have this here? It, it, there's no, um, it's not by accident that diabetics really need to come see podiatrists. And it's no accident that insurance companies uh, and your primary care doctors want them to be seen by you annually because there is a cost savings for that. So basically, for every one diabetic patient that's seen by the podiatrist, that pretty much saves 50 <laughs> from, uh, from having these, these types of conditions that I've been talking about. So for every $1 that's spent on a podiatrist uh, seeing the patient, $50 are saved. Next. And that's basically what, what I'm saying here. It's, it's a, it's a multi-billion dollar uh, issue if, if diabetics are not treated before it uh, develops into amputations. Next. So this is what I was just saying. Uh, every, for every dollar that's invested uh, by care by a podiatrist, up to $51 of savings in the healthcare system uh, you know, is, is had. And certainly commercial insurances, Medicare, they're looking at the, st the uh, statistics. The, I mean, they're, they're crunching numbers, so they know that. So they would rather pay for that podiatrist to come and be seen every year uh, and the primary care doctor that's referring the patients to you, they're gonna request the, your notes to make sure that the patient came or didn't come, some type of documentation, because there is a financial benefit in them uh, being seen by us. Next. So this is just another problem that, that, can, get, that can happen. Diabetic ulcer on the um, fifth metatarsal base around the styloid process. Next. 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 Next, we see this every day, all these pressure ulcers, uh, pressure areas rather. Uh, so if that's not addressed, uh, even the fungal toenails, if that's not addressed, they're gonna run into some problems. Next, next, certainly next. <laughs> uh, so so here, here, here's one of the things that we see. Gangrenous toe, it's leading beyond the toe up into the metatarsal area here. Uh, probably deeper and, and more proximal than we can just see right here. Next. Next. Spectrum of, of, spectrum of infections, cellulitis, abscess, osteomyelitis. Next. Next. So you have the different types of neuropathy. So I'm just kind of covering a, a, 
a myriad of things that we see as podiatrists as it relates to the diabetic patient on a daily basis. So of course, the sensory neuropathy, uh, patients are gonna come in, you know, they're gonna hit themselves on something, they're not gonna feel uh, when they do it, they're gonna have some deformity. Uh, even the autonomic neuropathy, uh, you know, with, with the sweating issue uh, or lack thereof, the cracked skin, uh, well, Doc, I've been putting this lotion on or this Vaseline on in my skin, you know, it just continues to stay dry and it cracks. Well, you know, there's an autonomic neuropathy uh, going on here. Next. Next. So the neuropathic changes uh, may resemble infection on MRI and other uh, images. So. We, we can't use one set of diagnostic tools to make our overall decision or our, or our final decision. We have to look at the entire picture. And so again, in our office, taking x-rays early on um, might not prove to show anything. You know, some, some radiographic changes are gonna lag. So uh, superficial cultures of a wound, that might not be everything that's growing there. Uh, and as we know, superficial cultures can be t totally inaccurate too. You know, you may have, uh, you know, these um, you know, organisms living on the surface of the skin, uh, patients that, you know, don't practice proper pedal hygiene. You may culture some, some uh, organisms that way. Next. So diagnosing uh, osteomyelitis. I mean, you have a, a myriad of things here, right? MRI, pro Moving the bone, cultures, biopsy, next. But overall, plain film radiographs, and I picked this up in my office too, just, well I have a C arm in my office, fortunately, um, and it allows me to be able to see the patient in motion. So when they wiggle their toes and move their foot, I'm actually able to kind of see that. I had a patient come in, healthy guy, um, so I thought, Brutal diabetic, very active. Actually, he's about seven feet tall uh, into sports. But in trimming a callus on the bottom of his fifth metatarsal head area, grabbing the, the midfoot, it felt very spongy. Like, you know, there was no bone there. But the skin was intact, no open ulcer, none of that. I said, no, this doesn't feel right. It doesn't, you know, I can't say it doesn't look right, but it doesn't feel right right now. So took, the, uh, took him to the room, put him under fluoro, the entire fifth metatarsal head down to the shaft of the fifth metatarsal was gone. It looked like cotton. There was no definitive cortical border to the bone at all. So he had, of course, you know, osseo. So all of that had to be cut out, resected, and he's doing well now. Next. Next. So this is just saying that, you know, superficial cultures can be misleading. Next. Um, next. Yeah, that staff was, I mean, that slide was just showing that staff is pretty much the overwhelming majority of the organism that you're gonna, that you're gonna find. Next. Next, let me just kind of sum what those busy slides were. If you have a patient that is questionable with their overall general health, again, your, their primary care doctor, hopefully their endocrinologist will be working with you with the care of the patient. Hopefully you've started to consult with them before there's you know, a serious problem with the patient. <clears throat> that doesn't happen all the time, but you know, hopefully you did. If the patient is in bad enough shape, of course, IV antibiotics are going to be the number one way to go, simply because patients notoriously are non-compliant. If you have them take the PO antibiotics, uh, a lot of them won't. A lot of them won't get it filled. You don't know that, but if you, have the, if you give the patient a, a written prescription, tell them to come back and see me in two weeks, they may not have gotten the prescription field when you gave it to them. It might take them a week or two or they may not ever get it. When they show back up in your office in two weeks, everything's worse, but it's worse because they didn't start taking the antibiotics, they didn't do what you asked them to do. But now you gotta fix a problem that has been uh, 
exacerbated. So basically, IV antibiotics would be the way to go if you can do that um, for these litigious patients or the unreliable patient, followed up by PO antibiotics. <clears throat> Next. I'm not going to get into all the different types of antibiotics. It's just better and safer if you do your culture and sensitivity. You know, you do all of your histology reports and all of that because that will give you exactly what you need to put the patient on, and that's what medical legal will require. So again, put them on, you know, maybe broad spectrum, something that's going to cover, um, you know, staph and gram negatives, maybe some gram positives, uh, but you know, you're going to do your culture sensitivity and all of that. Next. Next. So it has been determined that overall, PO antibiotics can be just as effective as IV. PO antibiotics can be just as effective as IV, providing the patient has adequate circulation. So if they don't have adequate circulation, PO you know, IV, none of that is going to really matter much. Next. 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 So again, you want to have the patient on antibiotics for probably an extended period of time uh, longer than you would normally uh, for just minor infections, simply because the organisms are just <clears throat> more resistant, more resilient. Next. Uh, this is just another patient that had uh, right fourth and fifth ray amputation, um, of course diabetic, retinopathy, fever, redness. Um, uh, the reason I'm showing you this is because <clears throat> it does not matter what all we do or what all we look for, it might not show up that way. Uh, you know, you, a patient may or may not have osteomyelitis, but we may not know that. Next. Sometimes offloading the patient to take the pressure off, treating them with different types of antibiotics, uh, along with our cultures, MRIs, whatever, we're actually just kind of grasping at what we think, we, we're practicing medicine. So based on what we have in front of us at that particular time, which may or may not be all that that patient needs, um, next. So even after that total contact casting to try to, try to off offload that weight, you know, um, they started, you know, developing this drainage. Uh, and so it, 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 didn't, it didn't heal at that particular point. Next. But the x-ray still showed no, no osteo. But, you know, ended up having to uh, do a resection of the fifth metatarsal. Ended up healing. That was taking the pressure off of it that total contact cast didn't. So even after all of that, um, you know, you're kind of months down the road. Next. So basically, you know, five months down the road after doing everything that you thought you needed to do based on the evidence that you had, uh, you, you finally end up luckily getting the result that you, that you wanted. <clears throat> Next. Um, so again, oral therapy likely as good as IV. Next. So before I go into this, I know, I know I've been kind of talking fast and going through a lot of slides, but are there any questions that you have before I uh, finish up with a few more? Okay. All right, so why won't this thing heal? So what's the thing? It's a diabetic patient. If they have whatever going on and you're scratching your head, why won't it heal or whatever? Well, of course, uncontrolled the compliance, vascularity, infection, whatever differential diagnoses, the nutrition. You know, I have patients that are, they're on dialysis, they have uncontrolled diabetes. Well, doc, I, I don't eat. So I'm like, okay, well, how can your body heal itself if you don't eat, you know? Um, and how can you control your blood sugar if you don't eat the smaller meals and, and take your, your insulin or whatever, you know? Yes, sir. What can the patient do to improve blood flow? 
if they're diabetic and they got a diabetic, what else? Is there anything they can do? If they, the, the most simple part of a patient's care, self-care, if they can do any amount of walking, aside from what the, what the physician can do, if the patient can try to walk a little bit in the house, they can take their walker or whatever, move around because the simple act of standing and moving, the muscles contracting a little bit, that can try to help circulate some blood. Um, so that's what a patient can do. That's, you know. Yeah. And just, just for explanation, yes, sir. Wise, the reason I'm asking, in our booth, we have a device in France that utilizes neuromuscular electro stem. Mm -hmm. It's not a TENS unit, mm -hmm. neuromuscular electro stem. And it literally causes that patient's calf muscle to contract every second, mm -hmm. 36 times, 3,600 times in an hour. Mm -hmm. So we're improving the venous outflow seven times mm -hmm. and the arterial inflow five times. Mm -hmm. So we can improve the rate of perfusion 20%. So uh, what I'm gonna do is for all the podiatry, I'm gonna do a follow-up letter and set out some material okay. for everybody that attended this so they'll know because that's all that's important. You're asking them to walk. Right, right. But the problem is it's hard to get them to walk. Right. It's hard for, to get them to right. For, for those so we have a device that is covered by Medicare right. and the other insurance companies mm. and it literally promotes or stimulates okay. things. Okay. So um, so we'll 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 have to check that out. Thank you. <clears throat> Next About the vascularity and improving blood flow, you know, vascular bypass graft. We are in patients with, you know, largely cellulitic, you know, diabetic deep wound infections. Are you seeing any change as far as um, the vascular guys wanting to revascularize before you actually IND initially? Well, sometimes, yeah. Sometimes, yeah. Usually, if the patient is not my patient or if the patient bypasses my office and shows up at the emergency room and then gets admitted from the emergency room by the hospitalist or whatever and then you know it, they're, they're consulted I'm probably not in the loop at that particular time and when I when I find out other things have already been done usually what I'm talking about is if that patient came into my office I evaluated them I scheduled them for their endovascular procedure by the people that I refer out to, then I'm kept in the total loop. And so what I don't want to have happen, if at all possible, is unnecessary open procedures for which the patient probably can't heal overall if they have something. They have other you know, generalized health issues going on. So if I can minimize uh, the invasive nature of whatever's going on, that's what I prefer. But to answer your question, Sometimes, I can't even put a percentage on it, but sometimes that particular point of care is bypassed if, yeah. I, if, if I'm not kept in the loop of that. I, I've just seen recently uh, in the last year or so where the patients that I'm admitting uh, for these types of procedures, you know, IND, deep, you know, wound infections, gangrene, that they're, I'm seeing, and I'm gonna get in, you know, a vascular consult, of course, um, but I'm seeing some change where they're wanting to do these procedures prior to me IND and the infection. And I'm just, typically I'm like, no, we're gonna IND this immediately. Right. It's emergency. Right. I'm just surprised I'm seeing that. And I was just curious if other, if there was some, you know, uh, studies or information that given us that's, you know, proven this to be the way to go. Yeah. I, yeah. Um you know, it's, it's, it's a mixed bag. I, I don't know. You know, my philosophy is you can cut, but you can't uncut. So if I can do something without open surgery first, then that's, that's the route that I want to go. Sometimes open surgery is the only option, open bypass. Sometimes that's the only option, but I don't want that to be the only thing I'm looking at, though. Next. This is just a patient who, you know, ultimately... Uh, the sequelae of, 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 you know, the diabetic foot, you're gonna end up with something similar to this Charcot. Next. Charcot foot, swollen, you know, collapse of metarsal joints. Next. Conclusion. Uh, so what I wanna end with is <clears throat> a couple things. 
in order to effectively treat our diabetic population, we have to use a myriad of things. First thing is gonna be common sense when that patient comes in. We wanna make sure that we get a decent history and physical on them. We wanna to listen to them because they're gonna tell us exactly what's going on, what brought them in for the most part. And if our vascular exam is not what, where it needs to be, we need to start that process of addressing that early on because if that patient is going to be long-term with you, they're gonna have some issues that's gonna, that's gonna develop after that. And so using the primary care physician as a point of contact, maybe because they referred that patient to us uh, to, in the beginning, using uh, general surgery, vascular surgery, um, infectious disease, endocrinologists, but what I like to use for any endovascular procedures first are interventional radiologists because they don't, they typically do not do the things that you're speaking of, opening up a patient doing surgery. They're doing these endovascular procedures where pretty much simple, go in, clean it out, open them up. They start the reperfusion process and everything is um, on the right road to recovery at that point. So I kind of want everybody to use, um, you know, use a myriad of, of things. The other thing is don't be afraid uh, to use PO antibiotics because they, they can be and have been proven, studies have shown that they can be just as effective as IV antibiotics. You want to make sure that uh, the patient's kidney status is good though. You know, you don't want to just load them up on all these antibiotics without making sure that their overall health is okay. Final thing is, if you are sending a patient out for endovascular procedures, they're going to have to, um, uh, you know, shoot some dye, you know, at some point in time to make sure that the uh, whatever occlusion is going to light up or not light up. Make sure that you become very familiar with the people that are going to do that and to make sure that they provide quality care for your diabetic patients who have chronic kidney disease or on dialysis because you can't just shoot this IVP dye in a person that's got kidney damage, you have to use CO2. Some of them don't consider that and your patient that you sent for one thing may end up with something else, end up in the hospital, and now um, you know, it's an un unintended consequence. So just being familiar with the people in your referral group helps the patient overall. Any questions?